The following audio drama is rated PG-13 for parental guidance. Psst. So, Jack is too shy to ask you to go and write a review of the Sonic Society on iTunes. So he wrote this for me to say. The Sonic Society. Because when you've got talented folks, they say it better. I don't know how much longer the tortoise can hold out. That YouTube weapon has broken open audio space right in the middle of Electric Vicuna and the Sonic Society. And the resulting tear in the fabric threatens the entire pod sphere. It's no use. I have no way to control the tortoise. Doesn't David know what he's doing? We're hovering right at the edge of the energy hole and barely able to maintain. According to these readouts, we're sliding into the tear in the audio space. Barely holding on to Joe Bev's Willoughby Part 2. And now the conclusion of Willoughby Goes and Gets It on the Joe Bev Audio Theater. Now that's enough of your sourness. Both of you. Why, I think Willoughby's game sounds like a lot of fun. And I think we ought to play it with him. Don't you, boys? The school marm challenged as she frowned with teacherly intimidation. Please, Miss Dawson, the future is not a game, pleaded a now sweating professor. Sure it is. You'll see. How about you, lady? What do you want me to get? Willoughby asked, pointing to Mrs. Way. <laughs> All right, she said, taking up his challenge with a perverse delight. Go get the man of my future, my soul mate. All right, I'll be right back. And off the boy went. Out through the archway and into the vestibule. Up the stairs, down the stairs, and into the kitchen. Into the cellar, up from the cellar, and into the bathroom. Into and out of the professor's rooms. And back into the dining room. Then, standing next to the professor himself, he proudly announced, Here he is! Both Mrs. Way and the professor blushed in embarrassment as the others broke into an uproar of laughter. <laughs> Even the dour Jeremiah who seemed to leap off his wheelchair with delight at the boy's cleverness. <laughs> Why, you rascal! exclaimed the veteran, sure in his conviction that the boy had no real contact with the future. <laughs> That's quite a con you've got. But let's see what you can do with this bit of fetch. Go and get me what the cripples will be using a hundred years from now. And it better not look like this wheelbarrow of mine. Got it? Right. I'll be right back. And off the boy went. Out through the archway and into the vestibule. Up the stairs, down the stairs, and into the kitchen. Into the cellar, up from the cellar, and into the bath. Into and out of the professor's rooms and back into the dining room. But emerging from the professor's quarters this time, entirely in the air, hovering, three feet off the floor in a magnetically levitating personal transportation vehicle of supremely future technology and style as he zipped around the dining room, over the serving plate, at its center, and then positioned himself directly over the veteran's head, 
laughing in unison with the vehicle's hum. <laughs> this time, Willoughby was the only one laughing. Amazed, the others simply ogled the spectacle of the floating boy and the nearly traumatized man beneath him, who was experiencing a fear of aerial assault he had not felt since the trenches of the Ardan. Willoughby! scolded the professor. You're frightening Jeremiah! He suffers from shell shock. Lower yourself to his level immediately. The boy complied gleefully, parked the device precisely level with Jeremiah's wheelchair, and jumped out of its cockpit with a flourish as he encouraged the frightening invalid to take the helm himself. There you go, all yours. And it's a beauty. It'll zig and jump any way you can zag and jive. Everyone was dumbfounded. All that is but the professor, Frank, and Miss Dawson stepped closer to examine the contraption, while the skeptical Mrs. Way remained aloof in her seat, and poor Frank turned his head away in fear. Although it took the utmost of Willoughby's continued prodding and instruction. Oh, come on, it's easy. Oh, you can do it. Get oh, on. See? I, Look, I can't all you do, do is it. you press no. this button, and then it goes know. up, I and you press this other it. button, and it goes I down. Oh, please it's don't. It's really make simple. Me. It works just I'm... like a wheelchair, except it can fly. Although it took the utmost of Willoughby's continued prodding and instruction, and the eventual supportive emergence of the other's own enthusiasm for the gadget the veteran managed to overcome his trepidation, transfer himself into the new vessel, and float about the room. And soon the entire household, up the stairs and down the stairs, into the rooms and out of the rooms, and back over the dinner table, growing ever more childlike, with each sweep of the space about him, much to the delight of Willoughby, and the foreboding of the professor until he became a positive nuisance to the others, who had to duck as he grew bolder in his motions and began to fear for their safety as well as grow impatient for their own turns at Willoughby's astonishing game. But none of their pleas had any effect. It was only when Jeremiah dizzied himself with a particularly sharp Crazy Eight figure that he finally landed. And Willoughby regathered his purpose. Okay, I'm ready for another one, announced Willoughby, turning to Frank and Miss Dawson. Try to make it a hard one this time, will ya? But before either one could respond, Professor Hudibras objected with utmost seriousness as he straightened up from a crouch under the table. That's quite enough, Willoughby. You're a menace. You know very well the chaos you may be creating with all this shuttling. God knows what you've done to the moments from which you have taken these things. Now you've had your meal, and it's time to leave. I won't allow you to extort me any further. I don't care how you make things appear. You don't belong here. Professor, your manners! exclaimed Miss Dawson at the professor's apparent rudeness, an alarm not all shared by the others. Jeremiah could only marvel at his hovercraft and think of a flying carpet while Mrs. Way couldn't help but perk up with worried curiosity at the professor's enigmatic reference to a more complicated relationship with the boy than she thought was proper for a bachelor residing in her house. Only Frank responded with similar urgency, leaping from his chair and taking the crouching stance of a professional wrestler to thwart what he perceived as the professor's threat to his own chance for a bit of his future. Now wait a minute here, Professor. This boy's not going anywhere. I believe it's my turn to play fetch, isn't it? Will it be my boy? Then straightening himself and smiling with satisfaction at his own ingenuity of conception and delightedly expectant with a curiosity about both the future and the limits of the boy's magical resourcefulness, he posed the boy his challenge. Now you're a clever boy, aren't you? Playing jokes on the lovebirds here and uh, pulling a gadget out of the professor's closet for the cripple. But what sort of short order work can you do with the fate of the world? 
Hmm, can you go and get me? He said, before pausing for dramatic effect, and then continuing, The end of the Cold War. Sure, beamed the boy, and once again, he scampered off through the archway and into the vestibule, up the stairs, down the stairs, and into the kitchen, into the cellar, up from the cellar, and into the bathroom, into and out of the professor's rooms, and back into the dining room. This time with a newsboy sling hanging across his chest from his shoulder to his hip and hawking in classic newsboy fashion as he pulled paper after paper out of his sack and slapped them down in front of Frank's face. Extra, extra, read all about it. Polish electrician boots out commies. Extra, extra, read all about it. Iron curtain opens. Berlin Wall crumbles, sold as souvenirs. Extra, extra, Soviet Union shuts down. Russians elect president. Extra, extra. As each paper plopped in front of his widening eyes, Frank breathlessly scanned their headlines and dates, barely able to catch the years of one issue before another supplanted it. 1989, 1990, 1991, and then, on top of the entire pile, Willoughby slapped down an illuminated tablet about the size of Frank's hand. Upon its face appeared a miniature image of the front page on which it sat. The last issue of newspaper dealt out to Frank. Of course, I couldn't carry three whole years, the boy anxiously explained as he resumed his normal speaking voice. So you can read the rest of the issues electronically on this handheld. It's real easy to do, but, well, it's a little hard on the eyes. If you want, I can get you microfilm instead. Microfilm was the only thing Frank was able to fully comprehend from the entire exchange. He knew that Russian spies used microfilm to steal secrets. And so, despite his general bafflement, he found it reasonable to accept everything Willoughby had just presented as somehow truly evidentiary. Looking open-mouthed, in astonishment at the boy, he swallowed to regain his voice and asked, What kind of prophet are you, kid? I assure you he is no prophet, interjected Professor Hudabras. Nor is he a boy, in the usual sense of the term. He is a simple mischief-maker who should be returning to his proper place before something goes horribly wrong. Now, now, Professor, I don't see what harm our young guest has done, reacted Miss Dawson. Like the others, she could not help but be impressed by Willoughby's feats, and wetted by them to satisfy her own curiosity about the future, she hastened to disarm the professor's growing hostility. I think it's fair to say, she continued, that we are all delighted with Master Willoughby's extraordinary game. And I, at least, would certainly like to continue with another round, as I think everyone else would as well. Glancing about the others, she found a nearly solid expression of support from their faces, which joined in looks of defensive reproach aimed at the professor. The exception was Mrs. Way, who continued to, <coughs> under her breath, furrow her brow and squint her eyes in suspicious examination of the boy, who stood in his perpetually impish way amidst them, with beaming expectation at his next task, fearing that an argument would simply fuel further inquiry into the nature of the boy and the circumstances of his arrival. The professor simply exhaled with resignation and took his seat with folded arms. It was a major feat for him. Retired a few years earlier, he had wielded an iron fist as chairman of the Science and Technology Department at Wilton University and was not used to relinquishing control, especially not to a child. Be my guest, Miss Dawson. Play ahead, he said through a forced smile and clenched teeth, rising from her seat as the professor sat down grumpily in his, Miss Dawson instinctively took on the demeanor of her profession, towering over the adults who were all seated now 
and the diminutive boy, who alone stood with the school teacher, like a favorite pupil, singled out of the class for special, almost maternal attention. Thank you, Professor. Miss Dawson bothered to reply, acknowledging the man's deference with a nod of her slightly cocked head, before straightening her posture and addressing Willoughby with academic propriety. Well, Master Willoughby, you are certainly quite a prodigy. I have had several thousands of students over these past years of my career, chiefly eighth graders, such as I am guessing you are yourself. Many of them very gifted, some dozen or so positively precocious, and I have nurtured them all with every expectation that each and every one would go on into adulthood to achieve the utmost of his or her potential as a knowledgeable thinker and responsible citizen. Rarely, however, have I had the satisfaction of witnessing their blossoming. They all seem to move away, many first to college or service, and then to the myriad and scattered career opportunities so abundant throughout this modern America of ours. So dignified seemed her remarks and her bearing that everyone about her including the professor, could not help but provide her with their full attention. They had been utterly transformed into good students, and sensing her command of them, she continued with her peroration. Then also, even the oldest of my pupils remain still too young for their, for their greatest undertakings and the public report to come with them. Understanding this incontrovertible aspect of time, and human development, I had always accepted the deferment of my ultimate satisfaction at their accomplishments and, and my influence on them to the later chronology of my career. But now... And she halted with a serene and doting look down directly into the eyes of the beaming and utterly rapt Willoughby, then continued... Now I know the urge to know the fruits of my labor an insuppressible one. And then, with solemn composure, with a deadly seriousness, she commanded the genie boy before her. Bring me, young man, my most successful student ever, at the height of his accomplishment. So enthralled were they all by the sublimity of her address that even Willoughby lost a beat in his impulsive enthusiasm and stood silently for many seconds before coming back to his usual life, as though out of a catatonic seizure with the disciplined response of a soldier. Yes, ma'am! And off he went, walking this time backwards out of the room, with his eyes still focused upon the woman's head, then breaking off into the vestibule, and instead of speeding up and down the usual steps, turning directly towards the professor's apartment door and entering it with a most deliberate gravity. The group he left behind remained motionless, a tableau of enthrallment with all that had come upon them. The simple surprise of the boy, the wonder of his marvelous retrievals, the intensity of their own satisfactions, and the longings they revealed. Jeremiah hovering still, Frank agape over the news, Miss Dawson erect, in expectancy, and Mrs. Way fixed in staring askance at the professor, and the professors abashed, simply abashed. Assembled around their table, here in their home, they found themselves part of a great unfolding, and they remained as though they had always been so. Until after longer than before, the boy again opened the door and staggered in under the burden of a corpse across his shoulders, her legs like an unstrung puppet's, her head like a flower, the back of its skull blasted open and peeled away into petal-like shards, and its pigment the pigment of blood, which colored her dangling arms, her clasping hands, and every step he took across the floor. The gruesomeness jolted apart the borders as they each gasped and moved back from the center of the boy's approach like identical poles of magnets 
until Willoughby dumped the body face down upon the floor. And the professor stepped forward in angry reproach. Oh my God, how could you? A horror like this for a game and through my rooms? The boy stood unflapped in the gore smeared upon him and responded unapologetically. It's what she told me to get. Then turning directly to Miss Dawson, he continued. You told me to get your most successful student ever at the height of his accomplishment. And I got him. Only he ain't a he. He's a she. The hint of logic in Willoughby's deflection of responsibility was just enough to draw everyone's horrified eyes to Miss Dawson, who desperately responded to their instinctual incrimination of her with a stammering effort to understand and to absolve herself somehow in the grisly business. Ah? Uh, ah? Uh, how do you mean ah? Uh, what, what I asked for? I asked for a murder? I never asked for this. What do you mean? Why did you do this? Who is this? She's the president, answered Willoughby. The president? exclaimed Miss Dawson. Yeah, the president. Some guy just shot her. I'll bet you're pretty proud, huh? Proud? I'm horrified to think I brought some child of mine to such a violent fate. I don't even want to know who she is. I, I never want to know who she is. I, I will not see a slaughtered corpse among my students. And then, unable to contain her distress any longer with language, she broke into an enormous inarticulate sob and buried her face, whimpering into the palm of her hands. A blanket of speechless compassion settled upon the entire group, with the odd exception of Willoughby, with an almost perverse impertinence observed. She was a pretty good president, and even a better one now. The remark aroused the professor to gallantry and broke the respect of averting of his eyes away from the woman's discomposure and toward the littered and askew tablecloth, which he saw for the first time was finely embroidered ivory linen. He stepped resolutely forward toward the boy and the corpse at his feet. Now that is enough, he said commandingly. I cannot permit you to go any further. Then, addressing the group, he held himself to account. I must apologize to you all. I have abused the hospitality of this household and its occupants. Desperate to protect the privacy of my scientific work, which, as you may know, concerns the navigation of time and space, I surrendered to the threats of this teleportal stowaway from another realm. And in order to avoid his raising an alarm about the propriety of a boy found within my quarters, I humored the boy's seemingly innocent demands to satisfy his hunger and acquaint himself with some of the inhabitants of this world. But I never expected him to wreak such havoc with you all as he has. <coughs> Groused Mrs. Way. Mm -hmm. You can't expect anything else from a boy in a boarding house. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't allow them. Mm -hmm. Willoughby <laughs> giggled with impish pride at her antipathy as the professor sought to correct her. But he is not really a boy at all, Mrs. Way. However he appears. But I was one once, interrupted Willoughby. Please, Willoughby, haven't you confounded them all enough already? Reproached the professor. Then turning in exasperation back to Mrs. Way, he blurted out the incredible truth as the boy stood by, growing almost transfigured, almost radiant with it. He is a very old and deceased old man. His youth is assumed the trappings of a customized afterlife devised by the spiritual technology of a place far, far into the future and far, far from this world. A place he is trying to flee. Although such an announcement ought to have estranged his audience with the extraordinary degree of its fantasticality, 
it settled mystically upon the other three borders with the rapturous enlightenment of the paraclete. With magical effect, Miss Dawson ceased her crying and lifted her face in a slowly forming expression of transporting serenity. Frank widened his eyes with the breaking insight of an epiphany, and Jeremiah grinned with the contented recognition of a providential rectification underway. Only Mrs. Way remained a reserve, the skeptical reserve of her compulsive cockeyed squint and breathless growling. But she was nothing to the others now. They knew only a forthcoming spirit. Jeremiah was first to the rescue, his war memories making him especially sensitive to the plight of refugees. Engaging the humming flotational mechanisms of his hovercraft, he elevated himself to eye level with the professor and said, You send that boy back and you might as well murder him. Don't you know anything about sacrifice? Ain't you been paying attention? Then, lowering himself to eye level with Willoughby, he offered the boy personal asylum. You can stay with me, kid. I got room for a cot. And then the others joined in with their own support. Hey, sure, said Frank. Stick around, kid, and I'll pick up your board so you can eat with us. You got good lowdown on the commies, and we could blow a whole lot of whistles. And then Miss Dawson, renewed now fully with the dignity of her professional erect posture, added promptly, And I shall enroll you in the eighth grade forthwith. You have an extraordinary aptitude for history, Master Willoughby, and many lessons await to be learned. I expect you will join my fourth period, the gifted class. They all seemed like swell ideas to the agreeable Willoughby, who replied simply, Okay! to each of them, to the consternation of the professor. Frustrated by this spontaneous adoption of a being he himself had considered purely an ontological nuisance, and alarmed by the disorder to science that it threatened, the professor interjected one dire caution after another in a desperate attempt to neutralize their sympathies. But it was useless. The boy had been virtually apothesized, as the innocent of innocence in their mind, and finally seeing it was so, and beginning to understand from the inscrutable smile of the boy how it was so, he ceased all resistance and insisted instead that the boy would share his own quarters, where his impulses could be controlled and talents with time could be constructively employed toward a nobler end than parlor games and the plumbing of his fellow boarder souls. You see, he explained to all, I have a plan to cure the world of all its ills. It was the true, perfect project to capture the boy's imagination. And Willoughby could not help but boyishly exclaim, Oh, boy! Come, Willoughby, dinner is done. The professor instructed, We have some science to do before retiring. And bring the president along. She must be returned. Your other party favors can stay. Eager to obey, Willoughby gathered up the corpse and hoisted it back upon his shoulders, then turned with the professor to retrace their steps out of the dining room, through the parlor, and back through the door from whence they had both emerged so surprisingly for dinner an hour ago. They seemed a son trailing his father to the others, except, of course, to Way who could only think of clearing away the table and cleaning up the bloody mess and wrestling away the other things that Willoughby had gone to get.
have been listening to the withering of Willoughby and the Professor, their ways in the worlds. Episode 18, Dimension X Revisited, or Willoughby Goes and Gets It, written by Joe Bevilacqua and Robert J. Sarasa, and produced, directed, and voiced by Joe Bevilacqua. The theme music was written and performed by David Garland. I'm your announcer, Mr. Announcer Man. And until next week, I'll see you next week. Hundreds of hours of wonderful audio stories for the entire family, just like this one, are available on Amazon, iTunes, and Audible. For Kindle, BlackBerry, Android, iPhone, iPod, or iPad download, or CD purchase or rental. Go to waterlog.com and make your ears happy today. That's waterlog with two G's dot com. Waterlog Productions. Did you know the Bear Manor Radio Network is haunted? For all of October, here's Professor Ludwig von Whatchamacallit and the ghost of Pierre Twilliger to tell you more. Has each of the paintings in this gallery come to ghostly life? You must guess the Bear Manor Radio Show it represents. <laughs> That should be easy peasy. After all, I is the present, current, and alive Bear Manor caretaker. I introduce these shows every month. To make it more of a challenge, Ludwig, I am preempting a number of the regular programs to make room for Halloween specials. <laughs> and what happens, if you don't mind my asking, happens if I fail? Because that is one of them their possibilities. You will take my place in this painting and be trapped there for all eternity! <laughs> I am sorry I asked. And now, Ludwig von Vachemakarlet, it's time to play. Name that Bear Manor Radio Show! Painting number one. Who is the ugliest one of all? The Cartoon Carnival Spooktacular One, Part One. Correct. <laughs> Painting number two. Sophie, you're crazy. The Comedy Orama Hour, Camp Vodolog Halloween Party, Part One, with guest Fred Freeze. Correct. <laughs> Painting number three! He said it was dull. No, he said it was boring. We take you now to Grover's Mill, the making of the War of the Worlds documentary, War of the Worlds parody, on the JTR show with Joe Bev! Correct! <laughs> Painting number four! In the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Audio Classics Archive presents The War of the Worlds with Orson Welles! Correct! <laughs> Painting number five! Things were very dull in the Old West. It's a cartoon carnival spectacular one, part two! Correct! <laughs> Painting number six! A cognac, an occasional cigar. A home time radio. Healthy Halloween tips. Super fruits. Alice Walker. Chef on a mission on Roma time radio with Chef Marcus Giuliano. Correct! <laughs> Painting number seven! Oh, I must say, it doesn't taste very good. The Last OTR Show presents Bulldog Drummond, Murder Visits Venus, and Cisco Kid, 50,000 Reasons for Death! Correct! <laughs> Painting number eight! Yeah, that's my kid! No, that's mine! Oh, it's the Cartoon Carnival Spooktacular 2, Part 1! Correct! <laughs> 
painting number nine. Oh, Mad Moses did. A Jazzorama Halloween. Correct. <laughs> painting number ten. And now it's the nerve center. The Comedy Orama Hour Camp Waterlog Halloween Party Part Two with guest Fred Freeze. Correct. <laughs> Painting number 11! Go away, ghost! We don't want you here! Cartoon Carnival Spectacular 2, Part 2! Correct! <laughs> Painting number 12! That one line always brought down the house. Arthur Gordon Shriver presents a look at Boris Karloff on TV and Broadway on the Mid-Atlantic Nostalgia Convention Celebrity Interviews. You are... I'm in! I'm in! Not so fast, Ludwig. First, you must listen to all 12 shows in order to be set free. <laughs> you can listen to the 12 hours of Halloween spooktaculars throughout the month of October at BearManorRadio.com. And waterlog with two G's.com. The Bunbury Banter Theatre Company presents Conception by Tony C. Pearson and Terry Kitchen. Okay, everyone, we're coming back from the break in 40 seconds. Studio, check lighting settings, fix Abe's makeup. How's the rating feedback figures, Jill? We're number two across the networks Let's tonight. Let's see if we can crank it up a bit and get number one spot. So you're a modern couple living in the hustle and bustle that is 2133. You want the best for your newborn child, don't you? We have packages of genetic modifications specifically adapted to your needs and pocket. You can choose everything from eye and hair color at only $35,000 to bespoke brain sculpting so your offspring can choose the career he wants. Send a DNA sample of you and your partner, your desired outcome, and details of your income to us today. Choose your baby the MMB way. Conception. The Genetic Upgrade Quiz is sponsored by MMB Company. MMB. Make my baby. Jill, auto camera one, long shot of the set, auto camera two, close up on the presenter. And we're back. Part three of Conception, and it really couldn't be any more exciting. It's neck and neck going into the final round. Remember, we're playing for the ultimate genetic modification for your unborn child. Sharon and Jonathan from New York, you have 22 points. And Emily and Thomas from Pennsylvania, you also have 22 points. The final round is a sudden death round. And the subject is... Ancient history. The first couple to answer a question incorrectly will be eliminated from the quiz, and we will have found our 2130 winners. Sharon and Jonathan, as you went second in the last round, we start with you. Here comes the first question that has been randomly selected by our computer, the lovely Zion. I hope you're good with history. Not that good, Abe. What about you, Jonathan? Not too bad, Abe. Not too bad. Okay, guys. Let's go for the question. And the question is... Set auto cameras three and four to give me shots of the contestants' faces. We really want to see their confusion. No help from the audience. Okay. Back in 2009, which man became the UK's first president, replacing their then prime minister, Gordon Brown? Is the answer A. Richard Branson, B. David Beckham, or C. Arnold Schwarzenegger? I know this one, Abe. Fire away, Jonathan. What's the answer? Are you sure, baby? Sure, I am, hon. Let's hear it then. I think the answer is C. Arnold Schwarzenegger. <sighs> Let's ask the computer. Zion! Is the answer C, Arnold Schwarzenegger? The answer is C, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> well done, well done, that's one of you. Okay, 
Okay, now, we turn to our second couple, Thomas and Emily. Are you ready for your question? Ready and waiting, Abe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've got the question here from Zion, and it's a bit of a toughie. How's your knowledge of religious history, guys? I was reading about that in the Reader's Digest just the other night. You remember, honey? I was reading it when you left to go bowling. Oh, I sure hope you can recall, honey, because I'm not too sure. Once again, can we have complete silence from the audience, please? Okay, Emily and Thomas. Which pope was assassinated by atheist fundamentalists in April 2017 on the occasion of his 90th birthday? Is the answer A, John Paul II, B, Benedict XVI, or C, John Paul III? I'm pretty sure that it's Benedict XVI. Oh, no, 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 honey. I remember this from high school. I can see Mr. Kowalski now standing in front of the class with his patch jacket and corduroy pants talking about religious history, and I can still hear him telling us about popes, how a pope was the chief guy in the church, and how John Paul III, the last pope, died in mysterious circumstances. Something still tells me that it's Benedict XVI, but if you're that sure, honey, then I guess we'll go with your answer. So, is John Paul III your final answer? Yep, that's the one. John Paul III. Let's ask the computer. Zion, is the answer C, John Paul III? <laughs> The answer is B. Benedict the Sixteenth. Oh, oh, well, I guess it's just not your night. But of course, you did very well to get this far. Come on, folks, let's hear it for Emily and Thomas from Pennsylvania. Well, you may have missed out on the star prize, but you do get to keep all the sensational items that you won from the previous rounds. From round one, you won the choice of your baby's hair color worth $15,000. From the quarterfinals, you came away with the choice of your baby's eye color worth $20,000. And in the semifinal, you won the genetic modification of your unborn baby's body type and shape worth $50,000. And let's not forget, all prizes are courtesy of our good friends at MMB, the biggest and best name in genetically modified children since 2010. Emily and Thomas, if you'd like to follow Marlene off to the green room, we'll arrange for the contracts and medical disclaimers to be signed. Once again, Emily and Thomas, ladies and gentlemen. Auto camera one, track them off, and return to a shot of the set. The others are bound to gamble, don't you think? That's why we picked them, Jill. It was in their profile. That means that Sharon and Jonathan from New Mexico, you are the winners of this series of conception! Yes! <laughs> in addition to all the genetic modifications you've already won for your fetus during the heats, you also win our top prize of CM4, which, as it suggests, is a level 4 adaptation, which, through cognitive modification, which will ensure that your child will have an IQ of at least 150, and so will be allowed into the higher class education program. That's great, Abe. Yeah, we want to do the gamble, Abe. Well, that's a bit premature of you guys. Let me explain it to you first, and then you can decide. Tonight's gamble is very special. All you need to do is answer one question correctly as chosen by Zion, and you, Sharon and Jonathan, will win the ultimate in genetic modification for your unborn son. It's a custom CM5 adaptation worth a quarter of a million dollars, which may eventually ensure him a place in the upper echelons of the government. Who knows, if he learns fast enough, maybe one day he could become president. Of course, once your child is born, he will immediately be entered into the government's brain academy, where he will be taught to his full potential from the day he is born. And as his parents, you will receive a government house and all expenses as you attend to his upbringing whilst he is being groomed for office. But don't forget, 
If you get the question wrong, then you will lose all the genetic modifications that you've already won for your offspring, and as his DNA has already suggested, he will cease being educated at the age of 13 and will take up his gene-designated lifelong role as an assistant checkout operator, and you yourselves will return home to your designated mundane lifelong roles as senior checkout operators. With no hope of any change. Ever. So, do you want to gamble? Yes, Abe, gamble! Oh. Gamble it is! <laughs> okay, for the CM5 adaptation and the rest of your lives on Easy Street, simply answer the following question which Zion has provided for me. These are good, greedy, and desperate, just how we like them. They don't stand a chance. <laughs> Get auto cameras three and four close in their faces. I don't want to miss a single microsecond of their pain. Cameras set. Let's hope she's a crier. Yeah, let's hope so. The public feedback ratings will be higher if they lose and she cries. And the sponsor will sure be happy if we hit number one. Oh. Absolute silence from the audience, please. Okay. Which? Classical song was played as a requiem at the 2120 Centenary Memorial Service to commemorate the brave troops that died during the War of Freedom that was fought in Iraq between 1991 and 2020. Is it A, the prodigy performing Firestarter, B, Robert Williams singing Old Before I Die, or C, Carly Minogue singing, I should be so lucky. I have no idea. How about you, Sharon? I'm not sure. I don't know. If I had to guess, I'd go for Robert Williams, but I'm really not sure. Well, it's too late to back out at this stage. Unfortunately, <laughs> you do have to make a guess. Do you know who it isn't? I Pine. haven't a clue, baby. If it doesn't make country music radio, then I just don't hear it. So do we go with Robert Williams? I need an answer, please, folks. I guess we've got no choice, honey. Hold my hand, babe. Let's do it. <laughs> Abe? Yes, Sharon? What's your answer? We think that it's B. Robert Williams performing Old Before I Die. <laughs> okay. Well, for the final time tonight, Let's ask the computer. Zion is the answer. B. Robert Williams performing old before I die. The answer is A. No. Quantity performing for a starter. Oh, please give us another chance, A. Eh? Please. Sensational. The ratings will go through the roof. <laughs> On the checkout. Well, that's it from another series of Conception. Unfortunately, no winner this time round, but do join us again in the fall. If you or your partner are expecting a baby and it's conceived after July 1st, then go to our website for details of how to apply. Until then, it's farewell from me, Abraham Bush. Okay, everyone, that was great. Get the losers out the building. We got it. Number one spot in the ratings. The drinks are on you, Al. Oh, these will be on MMB. Let's go celebrate. <laughs> Conception starred Daniel Rodriguez as Abe, Jane Dickinson as Sharon, Deirdre Whelan as Emily in Zion, Kevin Cook as Jonathan, John Palmer as Thomas and director, and Glennon Anderson as assistant director and commercials voiceover. Directed by Sam Beavis and Darren Mulryan. Produced by Philip Dyer. For further credits and information, please see our website, www.bunbanter.com. Well, at last, we broke free. We finished Willoughby by Joe Bev and ended up in the story Conception. But I'm still stuck here, somewhere in the tortoise, and I don't have the foggiest idea where to go. How do I know that if I take off in one direction, I won't be going further and further from the control room? The 
bungalow? Are you kidding me? A unicorn? The Sonic Society Season 10 is written and produced by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music provided by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society through Creative Commons licensing. The Sonic Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. This has been an Electric Vicuna production.